This is um, how the explanation for why the sun and the moon kind of travel the sky. They're being chased by by these wolves. And eventually in Ragnarok, they're going to swallow them up. And that's um, one of the big things that happens at the end of the world. Oh, husband. Oh, Odin's her husband. In the mythology, Freya is married to a guy named Ode. So Ode, Odin, there's some other evidence as well. Welcome to Gameology. I'm Dr. Natalie Van Dusen, and I'm a professor of Scandinavian studies at the University of Alberta, where I've been teaching for the last 11 years. I got my PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I've written a number of books and articles on various topics relating to medieval Scandinavia. Today, we're going to take a look at God of War, Nordic lore. So let's get started. He doesn't know what you are. Mimir is a god of wisdom. Kind of the beginning of time, there was this war between the two main tribes of gods, the Aesir and the Vanir, and he was one of the hostages sent over by the Aesir to the Vanir. And he was said to be very wise, was consulted for all these things. Eventually, he was beheaded, and his head was given to the god Odin, who often consulted with it for wisdom. Odin's had me imprisoned here for 109 winters. I don't know why he's trapped, he's imprisoned for 109 winters. The nine is interesting, kind of an important number in mythology. I don't know if this is meant to be Yggdrasil, Atreus and Kratos. I don't know enough about this game to know who these guys are, but those are not Norse names. The wrong place, little brother. The highest the wrong place. is not here in Midgard. It's in okay. Jotunheim. So he's in Midgard. Interesting. No. Okay. Saying he's in Jotunheim, the highest realm is in Jotunheim, but that he's in Midgard. And actually, Mimir and um, Mimir's well is in Jotunheim. This is the last known bridge to Jotunheim and all the realms. They're going over to Jotunheim, which is the realm of Jotunheim, often translated as giants. They're another kind of mythological race in Norse mythology. Giants might not be the best translation, because when we think of giants, we think like trolls and things like that. If it still exists, only a giant would know it. There's not a lot about him in the mythology, but he's really important to the mythology because it's his death that's going to set into motion the events of Ragnarok or the end of the world. This is definitely not what I have in mind when I think about Baldur. Again, there's not a lot that's like we're actually told about Baldur other than that he's supposed to be very, very beautiful. What you have cost me. Jörmungandr, Midgard Serpent. One of, actually this is kind of Thor's mortal enemy, is the Midgard Serpent, which is one of Loki's three kind of monstrous children that he has with this ogress. And Thor and the serpent are going to face off at the end of time in the final battle in Ragnarok. So it's not a surprise to see them facing off here. A lot bigger than I would have envisioned him, but um, then again, he's also said to like encircle like all of Midgard and the realm of giants. There's some interesting myths where Thor goes out on a boat and goes fishing for the Midgard serpent. So Mori and Magni are Thor's sons. They're kind of like part of the second generation of gods that survive the end of the world in Ragnarok. Boy play as big of a role in kind of major events in the mythology. They're more kind of the ones we're going to survive. This is interesting to see the game. The game use them and, you know, portray them as, you know, these very stereotypical Vikings with beards and tattoos and all of that, which is attested in some of the literature. And where do you think you're going? They're dwarves, and dwarves in Norse mythology, are they do exactly like what you're seeing them do here. They make weapons, can either help the gods or they can hinder them, but they're often, they're known for being really talented smiths. And that's exactly what they're doing here. They're kind of forging. Father, throw your ax at those trees on the other side of the bridge. Throwing the ax, typical item that would have been used as either a tool or a weapon. In the, oh, there he, here he, okay, there was some old Norse cursing there. <laughs> I just saw. Um, and we just heard as well, so they, they consulted some some experts for the language and the runes here. Look, you want I should upgrade her or not? Midgard or central enclosure. That's where the humans are, the human realm in Norse mythology. And water is often a, a boundary as well. So obviously the Vikings are known, perhaps best known for seafaring and their shipbuilding technology. Where are they going? 
That dragon, it's Baldur's. And this looks like a pretty, you know, typical, like a, it's a small version of kind of a clinker belt ship. Okay, so what's envisioned here is sort of quite small, when in reality, it's the whole world is sort of built around this tree. It's it's the center of the world and all of the realms of the entire cosmos are within the tree, within this world tree. It's, like a, it's visually like a really stunning game. It's very pretty. You have like really capturing that kind of, you know, the severe climate of Northern countries. Let's see what they're doing here. Huh. I'm curious what this is kind of based on. I mean, of course, we have the giants in Norse mythology, and those sort of evolve into sort of like the trolls of folklore. They're often thought to be, you know, they they can be portrayed as, as not very bright. Clearly, it's an enemy to be conquered here. But, um, you know, a lot of other times, the, the giants are don't seem to be that different from humans and gods even, and the gods even like get together with giants. Lord is maybe one of the best known of the gods. I think he must have his hammer there. Is that meant to be Thor? And the lightning, the thunder god. Okay, yeah, there's Mjolnir, his hammer, which is his one of his kind of special weapons. And I mean, he kind of has that, yeah, the, the stereotypical look that you would maybe Thor might have, the red beard. And, um, he's oftentimes called Old Red Beard. He's referred to in literature, so that's. That was for Boulder. Okay, we're battling Thor now. Not how I'd envision Thor, Thor to look. So Thor has like this belt of strength. He has the hammer. Yeah, those were all made by the dwarves that we saw earlier forging weapons and their special treasure is made for him. And it has a short handle because Loki interfered with the process. So using his hammer and the lightning coming out of it, he's the god of thunder and um, associated with kind of yeah, weather. It's so funny because it's like a Thor is usually like he's like the most beloved of of all the gods among humans. Like he's the most popular god. There's all these names in the Middle Ages that are Thor something for both men and women. He has this close connection with humans. So to see him like as some kind of an enemy that needs to be fought by this hero. One of Loki's monstrous children. He had these three monstrous children with this ogress that are destined to bring about all kinds of bad things for for humans and gods alike. He's calling to him. An absolutely massive, I guess in the mountains here, he's supposed to be in the water that is near the realms of Midgard and Jotunheim. But he's really kind of a, a dragon figure almost here. This is something that completely, you know, this is some artistic liberties being taken with the source material we have. You know, I'm not like a huge stickler for like historical accuracy because the interesting thing about Norse material is that, you know, what we have that's come down to us is still like just such a fraction of what there once was. So we're missing so much. And that's kind of cool because it means that artists can take liberty with um, their interpretations. Okay, so we're doing some tell me to lay down. It's interesting because we, we there aren't a lot of like depictions of Yamagandar who is the world serpent or the Midgard serpent. A lot of them that there are in manuscripts are like pretty late and he's definitely not that big. Ooh, Atreus is a giant named Loki. Okay, this is also consistent with Loki. Loki, I always tell my students, Loki is not a god, but he's one, he's kind of among the gods. He gets to kind of be with them. He's blood brothers with Odin. He causes all kinds of trouble for, for the gods, but he himself is a giant. He's a giant extraction. And yeah, like I said, he's the father of the Midgard serpent, as well as Fenrir the wolf and Hel, who rolls over the underworld. You're better than this. This is Freya. And Freya's a Valkyrie. So like having her, you know, swords and kind of equipped as a warrior is not, you know, totally out of the realm of possibility. Yeah, and she's definitely fashioned here as like a, a woman warrior, a Valkyrie, which are the women warriors, are these kind of this kind of troop of women who ride above battlefields and they choose the slain who are going to go to Valhalla where they're going to prepare for the end of the world. His fate is sealed. 
His fate is sealed. Okay, that's really cool. I mean, fate was one of these kind of central concepts in Norse mythology. Really kind of a lot of the material we have that survived, the old Norse material that we have, kind of this idea that your existence is ruled by fate and there's nothing you can do to change it. Claims Ragnarok's already been averted. Okay, and they're referencing Ragnarok, which is, um, or Ragnarokur, which is the doom of the gods, or sometimes called the other doom of the gods. It's the, the end of the world, essentially. It's the apocalypse in Norse mythology. It's when the, you know, the gods and the giants are finally going to come into like this epic conflict, and the whole world's going to burn down and be consumed by fire. And it's all set into motion through uh, the death of Baldur, who we saw. The giants have prophecies about me. Yeah, and prophecies as well is something you encounter. Prophecies so usually have a fate that's to come. So Heimdall's the messenger god. And Heimdall, as far as I know, I mean, there's a lot about Heimdall we don't know. There's this whole poem about Heimdall that is heard to in some of the sources called Heimdall's Chant, and it's missing. Very well, he could have been. But as far as we know, he's the watchman of the gods. And he's got this like super good hearing and sight, has this horn that he's going to blow to signal the end of the world. And I think this is meant to be meant to be him and the eyes glowing maybe to signify his his eyesight he's eating an apple the apples are uh maybe maybe it's in reference to the apples of immortality that the keep the gods alive there's these golden apples that are kept by a goddess named even uh, they keep the gods alive so maybe maybe that's a reference to that i'm not sure i think we're in asgard now i'm assuming we are he's at the top of the bridge between realms that leads up to asgard or the realm of the gods he means to betray you is that you, Loki? You a little trickster? Loki, a little trickster. So Loki is known as the, uh, the trickster. It's interesting because Loki is, he's a child in this because he's been around for like as long as Odin has. And also in the mythology, Loki and Heimdall are supposed to be like mortal enemies. They don't like each other for unknown reasons. Okay, Thor is Odin's son. Odin, yeah, looks a little bit different than I would expect, but he does only have one eye. He gave his eye to the Well of Mimir for wisdom and for kind of this 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 vision, this ability to, to know things. So he's the one-eyed god. Yeah, bearded, um, often portrayed as by being bearded. He's looking kind of scraggly here. The god of wisdom, the all-father, kind of, you know, the equivalent to Zeus, essentially. What, that's not good enough for you? I think they're sleeping. Okay, yeah, this is um, how the explanation for why the sun and the moon kind of travel the sky. So they're being chased by, by these wolves. So that's why they... Yeah, they move from one. That's how they explained the movement of um, what they saw as the movement of the, the moon and the sun in the sky from one part to another as they're being chased by these wolves. And eventually in Ragnarok, they're going to swallow them up. And that's um, one of the big things that happens at the end of the world is these wolves that are chasing the sun and the moon, which are driven in these chariots. They're going to get devoured. Just like inside their shrine. Their size is never described in relation. That's a difficult thing. The sources aren't that, they don't, they're not that forthcoming about how big a lot of these things are. And, you know, we're in relation to one another. You know, even things like giants, it's unclear in some cases if they're actually meant to be so much larger than humans or gods, or if they're just kind of another mythological race of some kind. I mean, Fenrir the wolf is supposed to be really big. These wolves don't get a lot of attention in the sources. They're just kind of mentioned in passing that they exist and that they chase the sun and the moon and are going to swallow them at the end of time whether or not they were actually at one point viewed as being larger than regular wolves i'm not entirely sure and that's the thing about the sources we have i mean sometimes uh, oftentimes what we have is maybe a couple of these things are mentioned only in a couple of sources Odin is a god a lot of a lot of things, one of which is the god of war. He's also the god of poetry and the god of wisdom. And he is so having this association with him as kind of like a, a big boss or something like that. Okay, and it seems like there's some runes glow, glow, glowing around his neck that are in some ways supposed to be. Oh, it's binding him. They're bind it's being able to magical binding by Freya. So this is, I mean, the idea that runes have kind of these magical properties is is really a little bit shaky. Runes are an alphabet. There's some indication in some sources that there were some spells and things associated with them. But for the most part, what we know about runes is that they were used to write things down, which like our alphabet is an alphabet. Each rune is a letter, essentially. But here they're really taking the idea of runes as something magical. You have no hold on me anymore. 
her falcon wings again. I like that they're doing that. I like that she's kind of has that Valkyrie quality. Is Freya's a goddess of love and fertility. Oh, husband. Oh, Odin's her husband. Odin in the mythology is married to Frigg, and Frigg is the mother of Baldur. And in this one, it seems to be indicating that Freya and Odin are married. But that's actually interesting because there are some scholars who have actually argued that Freya and Frigg are the same, that they're, you know, two names for the same goddess. So whether or not that's what they had in mind here, I'm not really sure. It's kind of an interesting, an interesting take. In the mythology, Freya is married to a guy named Ode. So Ode, Odin, there's some other evidence as well that indicates that it might just be the same, so. Roa tried to hide you from me, but this is your destiny. You're talking about destiny, champion of the Yathnar. The Yathnar is often translated as giants with a mask. Again, kind of referencing that idea of fate that's really inherent to a lot of what we know from the Norse sources. Which, incidentally, the movie The Mask is the mask of Loki. I don't know if that's where this comes from or not, but there is no, like, mask in the mythology. Odin's actually supposed to be really temperamental. That is something we know from the sources. He's not somebody, he's somebody that can get really easily angered. He'll take away his favor pretty quickly from somebody that he's otherwise sided with. Pretty fickle as a god. I could have had my answers. Odin and Loki are blood brothers. So there's all these like implications that they swore this oath to one another long ago times. But Loki and betrayal, those things kind of go hand in hand. I have to know what happens next has to know. That's one thing that's really, like, I like that they're doing this here. He always needs to know things. Odin is this kind of obsessive quest for wisdom. Sopna. Sleep? Sopna? Sleep? It's Ragnarok. Freya. Okay. Freya is Freya's twin brother. It's Ragnarok. It's here. Okay. Whoa. I'm not sure if that's meant to be the fire demon Surt or Surtut. It comes from the hot realm of Spellsheim. It's a big part of Ragnarok is that kind of devours the bridge to Asgard. Angerboda. Angerboda is the mother of Loki's three kind of monstrous children, the Midgard Serpent, Fenrir the Wolf, which I assume is what we just saw, then also Hel, who rolls over the underworld. Freya's a god of fertility, twin with Freya, one of the kind of that group of gods known as the Vanir that are associated with fertility and prophecy and things like that. Okay, so I don't know if that was meant to be Ragnarok, but there we go. Okay, I'm Natalie Van Dusen. This was God of War, Nordic Lore. You can find me on TikTok, The Low Key Professor, where I give mini lectures on Norse mythology and the Viking Age. If you want to check out more gameology, you can go to Facebook or YouTube.